Good morning, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. I'm Monty Gilliard, and I serve on the Creation Care Committee. And we're so happy to have Jim with us this morning. Uh, but I wanted to also just review what our committee does. So proud of what we've accomplished in the last year. We began about a year ago, and there were just a few of us, a few of us right here that showed up. And since then, our numbers have really grown, and we've also really accomplished a lot. But to read our mission, uh, to foster a greater awareness and appreciation of all of God's creation and its sacredness so that love moves us to gratitude and action on behalf of the more than human world. To create, nurture, nurture and maintain the landscape surrounding Trinity Church, Asheville, North Carolina, with an acute sense of the genus loca, the spirit of the place, and for the betterment of the natural world. To set an example at Trinity that it inspires others to reconsider their own landscapes and lives. So that's a big part of our mission is really for our members for the church to take what they learn at our committee home on and to um, do things in their own lifestyle. I, I brought this to so many. I feel like this should be my pocketbook. You know? <laughs> Because I'm always promoting composting, and that was one of our first accomplishments here at Trinity. We began, the church began composting, and also the Methodist, we inspired the Methodist church, and they compost too. So this is what I put on my countertop, actually, and I subscribe to Compost Nam, which is a service. But the county also has a free composting service. I just happen to love compost now because I get the compost back. It's for credit and I can put it in my own garden. So I encourage all of y'all to, to look into it. <laughs> and they also started compost now, which is wonderful. They have started to do doing hard to recycle. So they are. Uh, partnering with an international recycling company called TerraCycle. And so this is single screen, so you can only put one thing in there, but green work, which is that? No, I was just reading. Yeah, was, uh, the green work, which many of y'all might have taken your heart to recycle things to them. This I love because for $20, I can fill up this bag, they will come pick it up. And they'll have, you know, so it's just a very easy way to, and this, this is a, a pilot. So I'm really encouraging everybody to take advantage of it so they continue to do it. But this is through compost now. So a little plug for composting. But I also wanted to just um, tell you about some of the other things we've done. Uh, we had our first Earth Day collaboration with the Methodist and Presbyterian Church, and Barb and Susan headed that up, and we're continuing that collaboration this Earth Day. What is that day? Yeah, so, um, you know, we, we're we excited about that. We just had a great turnout, and the children are involved in some wonderful. We have had a garden tour at the home of Mac Day, and to benefit the committee, uh, we raised funds at the courtyard, really, and the landscaping around Trinity because of COVID and different things. We did not have an active committee. Uh, so we hired a maintenance company to come back and get us at a base level where we can now volunteer. And our institute right here, famous gardener at Trinity, is heading up. Uh, he, we did an art, we did a work day last April, but we're doing a big work day this coming. And we had a lunch and we had 32 people come. Everyone is welcome. You don't have to sign up. As Art said this morning, just show up. It is Saturday. Yeah. And uh, we, yeah. Anybody want to take ownership of the area of the church? Please contact me. Love to talk to you about it. Yeah, we had a field trip to the Highlands Biological uh, Botanical Garden. So we've really, in this short year, 
I feel like our committees may break. And we're thrilled that the person's allowed us to be sweet during the years. So I'm so happy to have him here. Um, when I first moved to Asheville, my friend Tia Blackford, and she was orienting me to Asheville, she said, one thing you need to do is read Wilma Dykeman if you really want to understand living here. And I love that Amy, what she wrote in our newsletter, we kind of followed up with that. That really to know this area, she gives you such great insight. She was an environmentalist and activist in so many things. So um, Jim's claim to fame is he's her son. <laughs> and it took a lot of work, I can tell you. He's, he's Not a, my work. He's a, Jim grew up in New Hampshire, Tennessee, and his wife Anne is here. And I heard her say that they had lived other places for 35 years, but you were an Ashevillian. So we're glad they decided to come back here. Um, Jim graduated Phi Beta Kappa from Yale University with exceptional distinction in American studies. He later received an MBA from Stanford University and embarked upon a 25-year corporate career in human resources for the Hay Group, Brown Foreman Corporation, and Sylvania. In 2011, he and his wife, Anne, moved back to the Southern Mountains and now live in Weaverville, North Carolina. He is the author of Constant Defender, the story of Fort Moultrie, and co-author of Mountain Home, a pictorial history of the Great Smoky Mountains National Park. Please welcome Jim. Thank you. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Can you hear me back there? Yeah, uh, the old story of the uh, one of these gray eminences of politics, you know, put you to sleep within a half hour. Well, he'd been talking for 45 minutes and the power went out. Big audience. He said, can you hear me back there? And the woman stood up the no and, I, and a man stood up here and tom right over here he stood up in the front row and he said well i can hear you now i want to trade places with her and my last joke is uh yesterday i sent my brother a get better soon card he's not sick i just think he could be better so uh what we're here today to talk about uh, mother's environmental legacy uh this is part of her it's kind of like touching an elephant many People have said, you know, I want to write your mother's biography, but they are, are, are approaching her like from the ears of the elephant. She loved elephants, the ears of the elephant, the, the environmental, the, uh, the legs of the elephant, uh, civil rights, the, uh, the belly of the elephant, uh, Appalachian and Appalachian studies. She was a mother of Appalachian studies. Uh, the, um, the tail of the elephant, novelist. Uh, so she was just so many things, journalist, uh, writer. She was also a great mother, uh, super mom. And uh, I, I just uh, great to see old and new faces here. So I appreciate, appreciate you all and appreciate the turnout. But mother, uh, we, uh, we, Ann and I have a little uh, public charity nonprofit. Uh, and we're, we've succeeded over the years in refining mother's core values to three, environmental integrity, social justice, and the power of the written and spoken word. So our mission in 13 words is to uh, sustain and promote social and environmental justice through the written and spoken word. That's what she was all about. She, she combined a uh, facility with the written word with a world-class skill. Liz, is that right? As a, as a speaker, public speaker. And uh, when you got that in one body, uh, you've got something. You talk about synergy, written and spoken. So she was all about getting uh, getting her messages out, and that's why we do what we do. And uh, I'd like to take a few minutes and, in this PowerPoint, talk about her environmental legacy and, and, and end with a case study here in Asheville to kind of illustrate what her, what her uh, process was. What is a legacy? Well, it's uh, something received, as Webster says, from an ancestor or a predecessor. Um, she received uh, a wonderful education in the environment and the, the fact that all things are interrelated uh, from her parents up at the head of Beaverdam, the Beaverdam Valley. So she grew up here in Buncombe County, 
uh, on Lynn Cove. If you've ever gone up to the Blue Ridge Parkway via Beaver Dam, you take a right onto Webb Cove and wind all the way up to the Craven Gap. But at one point, you could have taken a left, perfect Y fork. You could have taken a left to Lynn Cove. And that's one of the most beautiful little coves in the in the mountains. But uh, that's where she came to environmental consciousness as early as seven, eight years years old. Uh, she was she was a uh, she was a real environmental innovator. We're talking eras from one era to the other. So what was it like in the pre dykeman progressive area? She was born in 1920, died in 2006. So. So she was doing her thing in the uh, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and the progressives, of course, were the 1900 to 1920s or thereabouts. So I'm gonna I'm gonna read a few notes just to give you an idea of what the progressives are. Uh, in 1903, President Theodore Roosevelt posed with John Muir for pictures on overhanging rock at the top of Glacier Point. He camped in a hollow there to, to await the five inches of snow, which delighted Roosevelt. He had sent Muir a letter saying, uh, I want to drop politics absolutely for four days. Can you believe that? Is it possible for any of us to drop politics for four days? Uh, and uh, just be out in the open with you. At their meeting, Muir spoke of environmental degradation uh, and asked for another layer of protection as a national park. And he convinced Roosevelt and California Governor George Pardee, who was also on that excursion, to receive the state grant. It had been a state protected, kind of like the Adirondacks, and make the valley, Yosemite Valley and the Mariposa Grove part of Yosemite National Park. So that's what that's what the that's what people like to remember from the progressive era. However, there was another five. <laughs> You know, things are complicated. <laughs> so again, situated inside Yosemite National Park, the Hetch Hetchy Valley was described by pioneering naturalist John Muir as one of nature's rarest and most precious mountain temples. Basically, that was um, uh, that was a victory by the city of San Francisco in 1913 which won congressional approval to carve Hetch Hetchy out of the National Park, flood it, and bury it under 300 feet of water. Uh, Muir campaigned against it. The silver lining was that he started a club. What was the club? Yeah. Sierra Club. But, uh, you know, we could have had Hetch Hetchy. So, uh, you know, the progressives, uh, that's probably a, a pretty interesting characterization of the progressives. You got two world-class beautiful valleys you preserve one as a national park flood the other so the progressives never saw a butte in the west that they didn't want to blow up uh, they were all about mining and all about and they never saw a river in the west that they didn't envision as a navigable river so they dredged they uh, built canals they began to treat the west as a as a as a another country, you know, west of that Mississippi River, and uh, and it provides us minerals and ore, and um, you know, and then we then we explode the atomic bombs and do our thing, you know. And we we live we live on the east east coast, and we're just one. Uh, so Wilma was a real thought leader when she came along and really began publishing in the fifties. So her book on the French broad and the culture and history here was published in 1955. It was the 49th, whoops, the 49th book. What am I doing? The 49th book in Reinhardt's uh, Successful Rivers of America series. Um, it was the first, it was the 49th, but it was the first book to devote a chapter to pollution, to discuss pollution at length. One book in those first 48. <laughs> had talked about pollution at any length, but they said nothing to see here. Everything's fine. We built all this green infrastructure, uh, sewage uh, treatment plants. Uh, we, we got it. We got it under control. Whoops. I got I to gotta stop moving. Liz, I don't want you to do this ever again. It's not my fault. I was a consultant, folks. 
Okay, here we go. Here we go. Oh. Excuse me for living. Uh, the publisher did not want her to uh, include that in the book. So how many of you here have ever written anything or just kind of thought of yourself? I just say, what, what might I write? Raise your hand. Uh, just, uh, you know, would like to, yeah, there you go. I see hands. Uh, the mother was in that situation. She had not published a, a, a big book. She had not published a book until 55. She had tried. And the publisher said, look, if you take this chapter out, we're going to publish this book. So it'd be like playing baseball in the farm league. Mm -hmm. For the tourists, and then you get a call saying, "If you, if you, uh, you know, are willing to uh, to jump through this hoop, we will, we will call you up in big leagues, but you got to jump through the hoop." And uh, mother response was, "No, that's the chapter standing." And so they published it anyway, and uh, she did say that she was going to call it "Who Killed the French Broad," and maybe they'll think it's murder. <laughs> Uh, her game-changing idea was uh, we can make the pollution issue, and it is an issue, a win-win solution rather than a win-lose solution. Um, uh, when you talk about uh, econ economics and the environment, it's not about a tree versus a dollar or a river versus an industry. Um, and basically, she agreed with the progressives uh, as far as the old Roosevelt Muir paradigm went. We need national parks. Uh, she loved the Wilderness Act uh, that came along uh, to preserve wilderness areas where nature rules and there should be virtually no trace of man and woman. Uh, she said that uh, uh, one way that environment is economically beneficial is it will attract hunter, fishermen, and tourists. But then she went further. And she said there are more significant economic reasons to respect our environment. And um, basically, she she had this idea of a virtuous cycle where a community with a culture of conservation will attract executives, plant managers, their staffs. She knew enough about uh, industry, along with her husband, my dad, James Stokely, to know that uh, business is not just a faceless agglomeration of people. Uh, business is people who, like all of us, are making personal and organizational decisions. So uh, what executive, what plant manager, what production manager, what uh, engineering manager, what human resources manager, what control, what plant controller is not going to want to to move with their families to a to a community with a with a with wonderful nature around it and and pure water. Uh, so, so basically, uh, that was the nut of her of her pioneering, and I, I've never heard anyone before 1955 make this case. So, uh, so think about 1955 to 2024. That's we're we're talking more than 75 years. So she was a little bit early for her time. She was pioneering there. The second issue of the virtuous cycle is that um, pollution is costing the introduction of new industries. Um, factories uh, who don't treat, who take advantage of their riparian rights. In other words, if the French broad is flowing here, my factory is here, I can do whatever I want on this part of the river. If you just uh, flooded with dioxins and uh, you know who knows what. You're not being a good neighbor to your to your downstream uh, fellows. So basically, pollution is preventing the location of industrial sites downstream. And then finally, this is a real business. Very. How many people here uh, have worked in big business in some fashion? There you go. I guess, yeah, there you go. Big organizations. Um, I want to read this. The people of the French Broad Basin, as well as those of other river basins, therefore owe it to themselves to make sure an adequate supply of suitable water is available for new industry. And they owe it to the industry. The people owe it to the industry. Now, 
What environmentalists have you heard of lately who is making an, an argument that we owe something to businesses, uh, including local government, uh, uh, to present them with a firm policy of pollution control by which they can chart remedies and their course of production and cost? For anybody who worked in business, would you rather be certain about something or uncertain about something? Third. Sir? Sir? Cool. Exactly, because you can budget for it. And you might be able to pass it on to the consumer. You might have to eat it. You might have to, to make some compromise. But this is uh, these are these are real practical insights uh, that she had. And then as a prophet, she was uh, pretty good with the written word. And she says, uh, and you should have heard her, you should have heard her harangue through <laughs> this. Why then we will have allowed ourselves to suppose the scum on our river inevitable. There is one answer, the apathy of each of us. She could have blamed champion, put the paper and fiber over in Canton. That's the French broad. The pigeon in Tennessee is, is one of the two great tributaries of the French broad. But she didn't. She blamed all of us. In a democracy, there is no stronger regulation than the will of people. Let the people's will then speak with the law. And what was that law? It was the Clean Water Act of 1972, passed, passed over uh, Richard Nixon's pocket veto, by the way. Um, she was also, uh, she didn't know it at the time, this word didn't even exist, but uh, people now talk about her as one of the original eco feminists. Uh, where uh, where uh, a line of thinking that uh, sort of merges uh, nature support and uh, and matriarchy rather than uh, rather than patriarchy. Um, if you remember back to the progressives, you know uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Gifford Pinchot, you know that that wrestle that wrestle for support. Also in the nude. Yeah. So that's TMI. Just thought, just thought you would want your to know about your former president and the and the creator of the National Park Service. Yeah. So I'm not of the National Forest Service. Uh, big difference, as you all know, National Forest Service under the Department of Agriculture, trees and crops, National Park Service under the uh, Department of Interior trees as part of a forest ecosystem that should be protected, and then Wilderness Act. Wonderful Wilderness Act goes further than that. And it's just a wonderful thing. One of the great things is that the Shining Rock Wilderness here is part of, part of, part of the wilderness, is that wilderness area. Cherokees thought of Shining Rock as the center of the universe. And if you go there, you know, it's a magical quartz forest, basically. But uh, Elizabeth Engelhard, who now teaches over at uh, Chapel Hill, says Wilma Dyer is a living ancestor of today's ecological feminist theories. And going back to the legacy, what is a legacy? Something received from an ancestor or predecessor. Okay. So, uh, what is the Wilma Dyer legacy? I mentioned that it's a, it's a little nonprofit. Uh, we develop and sponsor programs and products and services. No, no uh, body on staff. We we have no pay staff. Uh, Ann and I basically devote significant time to doing our doing our programs. We have a few donors, uh, and with a, with those with that money, is we pay our presenters. Uh, Monty's paying me. Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, six figures? <laughs> no. Uh, I do make a six-figure salary. Two of the figures are to the right of the decimal point. Uh, but but everything we do is oriented to either environmental integrity, social justice, or the power of the written and spoken word. And you'd be surprised how much overlap there is between those three things. So uh, for the for the for the last uh, third or quarter of this presentation, uh, how, how much time have I got? So what is environmental integrity? You notice the way we, we phrase that core value of environmental integrity. Well, uh, it's not tree hugging, although we love trees. And it's not um, it's not dollar loving, although we love dollars. With dollars, you can do a lot. Uh, 
Integrity is firm adherence to a code of especially moral or artistic values. So what was Wilma's moral code is based on inclusive inclusivity, equity, and the right balance for the situation. So if you're going to be a real environmentalist, you have got to do your homework. She always always talking about hard minds and soft hearts. We've got to have hard minds and soft hearts. We got a lot of politicians now with the reverse. <laughs> hard hearts, man. Uh, you know, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be the world's hardest DA, yeah. and then I'm gonna be elected governor, and then Katie bar the door. That's a hard part. Uh, and how about the mind of that person? Is that is that mind an expansive mind that can that can hold conflicting ideas and 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 make wise judgments? No, that's a soft mind. So uh, if you're going to be an environmentalist, you 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 got to rise above fuzzy thinking. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, we're going to take the jetty ray controversy in the river. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Well, a few years ago. Um, 2019, uh, Eric Sheffer, very successful restaurateur. He has Jetty Ray now on Charlotte Street, but he proposed that uh, that he put this restaurant, this seafood restaurant, by the uh, French Broad River, just a little bit uh, north of Gene Webb Park. So it's, it would be between Riverside Drive and Gene Webb Park. It would be in the strip at that time zone public use, which was which was basically the golden goose that was created from 10 years of work by uh, Karen Craig Nolan, Riverland, the city of Asheville, many millions of dollars granted from the Department of Transportation, uh, et cetera, to, to clean up the, the that strip running from the Amboy Road Bridge all the way up to Craven Street Bridge between Riverside Drive and the, and the French Broad. Just clean it up of junk cars and contaminated land. And uh, actually, it required a little bit of eminent domain. If you remember the 12 bones uh, controversy, everybody's nodding now because we all like barbecue, right? And uh, so, uh, so basically, 12, 12, 12. And what have you done? Anybody, uh, anybody been married a long time? Uh, I've heard people that say I've been married 60 years. We've been married six years, never a harsh word between us. I say, are you zombies? You know, you got, you got your brain working. I use it for something more than a hat rack. Well, basically, what Eric Sheffer, as a good businessman, wanted to do was to piggyback on all these millions of dollars and all this work. Talk about externalities, you know, these uh, and the, the tragedy of the commons. You get a uh, uh, you get a coal plant that is polluting the air. Not a problem for them. It just it just flows flows down the Ohio River to Louisville and uh, causes everybody air pollution health problems. Uh, so that's an externality. Well, uh, Jenny Ray would have been would have been a nice seafood restaurant on the banks of the French Broad, but it would have it would have been uh, it'd be like you're walking along a greenway, and suddenly you see a you see a dumpster dumpster, mm -hmm. you know, and and you start smelling uh, yesterday's fish. Uh, uh, some people are enjoying themselves, and some people are not. So. Uh, some of us took ourselves down to uh, the Planning and Zoning Commission. It was about ready to be to be a done deal. And we took ourselves down to the Planning and Zoning Commission. And on one side was a whole bunch of people dressed like me, sitting like this. And they were lawyers and uh, uh, kind of regimented uh, supporters of, of, this, of this idea. Uh, and Eric is a good man. And on the other side were Karen Craig Nolan in a wheelchair and Jane Matthews, architect, and uh, some, some, some folks just like me, old folks who, who you know, had bought into to the whole vision for the River Arts District. And we got up and we talked. There were seven people on the commission, and three of them said, look, I know what you're trying to do. 
uh, you're trying to keep this restaurant from going in. But look, we've had this, this drive and this land for years, and this is the first concrete business proposal we've had. What's going on here? You know, it's high time that we put this restaurant in. Well, a guy named Brian King got up. He was the manager of Quellbone. And he got up and he said, he said, I can't, you know, I'm not a public speaker. But he said, what am I just chopping middle? Mm -hmm. He said, you just went through this huge controversy to kick me out. I had to go to uh, the foundry and, uh, and Sweet Creek Road. And now you're going to put another restaurant in? Mm -hmm. And then uh, I got up, talked about, and invoked my mom's name, talked about this, talked about that. Uh, Karen Craig Nolan got up. Jane Matthews got up. So three people, so it went to a vote. Three people voted for it. The three who said, look, enough's enough. Let's get some, let's get some activity going on down here. And three people against it. And it came down to Laura Hudson. So if you go down, you go on North Merriman Street and you go past the old fire station in Brooks Howell Retirement Home, she's got her office uh, right there. She's an architect. And she said, you know, she said, I think, I think the River Arts District is going to look real different in 20 years. We won't recognize it. She said, uh, Jim, is this the widest part of that strip? I said, yes, it's the widest part of the strip. She said, I think, I think we can hold off a little bit longer. So she voted no. Mm -hmm. So what was the solution? Well, the solution was um, at the time in 22, a mixed use uh, kind of small hotel. Now it has evolved into a uh, into apartments, and the city council passed it. A couple of the city council members, uh, this was last year. A couple of city council members said there's not enough affordable units, but it's now the sort of the standard that standard argument. It's going to be it's going to be apartments or condos, uh, and. Uh, it's going to be on the Riverside side. Our arguments to the Planning and Zoning Commission was that there's an easy solution to this. The strip between Riverside Drive and, and, and the French Broad is zoned public use. So that was the status quo. The developers were not saying, let's keep the status quo. They were saying, let's change it. And what they want to do is put the restaurant there by the river. We said, look, easy solution, move across the street uh, where the cotton mill was and, and, uh, and uh, various art studios and second gear and so on and so forth. Just move across the street. That's conditional zoning. That that will be perfect for you. So that uh, that swayed Laura, swayed the Planning and Zoning Commission, and uh, and this is going to happen. Uh, so there's going to be uh, there's going to be construction down there uh, before too long. New construction. And you if you drive down there now, you see a tremendous amount of construction. So Laura was right. Um, so, but, but that's an example of, uh, of the continuing balancing that you have to do in these situations and the, and the knowledge that you have to know about. Yeah. Um, that's correct. Uh, it, it does, uh, public use, uh, Public use means that uh, it's pretty much a park or 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 reserved for public use, and it's going to be a continuing saga. I mean, it's a good question. That nothing is resolved. Uh, it's it's it requires eternal vigilance. Uh, that's what democracies do. Yeah. No, no, they're on the other side of the street. Yeah, where the old cotton mill was. Yeah, thank you for that clarification. So this is the last slide. What is her legacy to us and our children and grandchildren? Who here has grandchildren? Wow. We can we can raise our hand. Thank goodness. A way of thinking, acting with integrity, actions match principles. Integrity means you walk the talk. That's all integrity means. Appreciate the national, the natural world, which includes us humans. I remember an old uh, Kiwanis Club meeting I went to in Newport, Tennessee, 50 years ago, you know. A fellow who was a supply minister said, he ended his talk, he said, and as you all know, 
we humans were a little above the animals, a little below the angels. Uh -huh. said, yeah, that's right. No, that's not right. We are part of nature. I've, I know trees. I know trees that uh, um, have lived better lives than, than most humans. Um, so think practically and attend to the details. That's what the whole Jetty Ray case study was all about. Let your emotions, your passion, empower your thoughts and actions. Drive them and keep you in the game, but don't let them overshadow you at any decision point. And then finally, work diligently, continuously, as if our lives depended on it. Wow. That's it. Thank you. Cut it off at any time. Yeah, yeah, Tom. So, uh, how was Wilma's uh, book received at the time? And uh, do you think there's been periods where it was sort of ignored and then it's been restored to public visibility? I mean, I think through your work it's, and other other environmental trends, a lot of people are reading it today. That's true. Amazing. I had to pay Tom a hundred dollars. He, he described it exactly. Well, he described exactly. Tom Tom's question was, uh, how was the French Broad received back in 1955? And it seems like it was ignored for for a while thereafter, and then has it's has been restored, people getting attention now. Uh, so basically, not only was it received well, but the pollution chapter was was the focus of national attention uh, and uh, it was uh, there's been so much time elapsed that from uh, I would say from about uh, the mid 70s uh, it's kind of like it, it goes with Asheville you know Asheville was depressed during the 80s and, uh, and 90s so during that 75 to 95 period it was kind of tough and then mother met Karen Craig Nolan and vice versa. And Karen Craig Nolan, who had been the wife of the GE executive, she's passed away now, but uh, she was a, she was in a prime back in the years. And she had the vision for the River Arts District. And she and Mother bonded immediately. They were both optimists. They both had a sense of humor. They were both high energy. And uh, they were they were kind of unstoppable. And Tom, that revived, Karen revived, helped revive the vision that Mother laid forth. And uh, and mother really appreciated Karen's uh, energy and her her she was a lawyer and her implementational ability. So the two of them were wonderful. And came this close to getting the French Broad and American Heritage River vetoed by Charles Taylor. Um, mother was shaking her shaking her fist as his office uh, pulled up down on the big part. I mean uh, Pack Square. Um, but you know, uh, mother uh, she could work across the aisle she could work with anybody uh, because this idea of environmental integrity means you can't you can't not be a politician you can't you cannot not compromise you have to know the details and you have to just make sausage and get it done lamar alexander appointed her tennessee state historian back in the 1980s so that's that's one example so uh yeah so so her vision is coming to light now and a good thing. Yeah, Liz. Um, well, I just wanted to say, to remember when the book came out, and I was in the fifth grade, and she and my mother had become friends, and I'd been wanting to be a writer since I was in the first grade, and already had my own newspapers here. <laughs> but I went to the library, there were never any books about or by women. There were none. And she was the first mother brought her to the house. We lived in Possum Trot in the Manograms. And she came over and I can remember that moment of meeting a real female writer. And she was my role model. And uh, and I was only 10 years old and she, what a difference. And you were a little baby boy. Yeah. <laughs> I'm an infant. I'm wait, a, wait, 30. Am I 30 or 20 years Anyway, she was, I wanted to add her being, as you mentioned, uh, the eco-feminist and all, yeah. but she was also a feminist and and just a role model because 
you know, as we knew, everybody knew about this great book. So it, it did get received with great applause here. And yes. it was a big, huge deal. She should have at least be named. So when we moved back here, and actually, Ann was a little bit worried, you know, I mean, what daughter-in-law wants to be in the constant shadow of, you know, of her mother-in-law. And we moved back here and not only were they not talking about, uh, not not celebrating well, but they, they had forgotten about it. The people who loved her, who Liz is talking about, were in assisted living or the alternative. <laughs> and the people who were moving in from New Jersey and California and Florida, who is, what is this Wilma Dyke? That's a weird name. What, what's the name like Dykeman doing down here? You know? um, so um, if you want to know more about Wilma uh, in some detail, I would suggest you get her, her, her book, go to Mel Prop, buy her book, Family. Childhood. It's about the first 14 years of her life on Beaver Dam. And it'll give you a good introduction to all the themes of her work. Pick up a copy of the brochure. Consider, uh, consider visiting our website, which is... Uh, what will cost you a dime, and we have regularly rotating articles and resources, including audio and video in these core value areas. Uh, so, and she was also, and your father were early civil rights leaders. That's right. Mm. That's right. And uh, we celebrate mother's mother's birthday anniversary in late May uh, every year at the uh, at Black Wall Street down down by the river. And uh, we're going to have a good program this year on May 18th, Saturday, May 18th. Yes, sir. I, this week I wrote, well, I looked at the uh, really kind of disappointing uh, remaining industry is the paper industry there. Now, I guess I would think legally they are grandfathered, therefore, they're there for eternity if they would. But I wonder if there's any insight, if there's any kind of movement or anything to try to get that. Industry. Uh, so are you speaking of Canton and the Pigeon River? I'm not I'm speaking, well, I don't know what it is, so who owns it? But as you go before you come to, uh, you know, where all those, uh, there's a big paper packing pen. They collect yeah. paper and they send it all the way. It's rather, and I, I, I mean, if that reaction, you wouldn't have a status as the ability to harvest. I would think it's grand because it's been there, that you yeah. could stay there forever. The second thing was, I'm so curious. I guess the city blessed all this graffiti. Yeah. I know it's bark, but I think it's really something. Uh, but I know I've been in arguments with graffiti art. And maybe it's better than just looking at the old wall. It doesn't seem to be decreasing, it seems to be increasing. All right. So let me I'm going to ask answer both. Uh, the graffiti question, the graffiti will stay. Question again, it's it's industry by industry. The one that worries me is the dredging industry. Uh, I think upstream from where 12 loans used to be. Um, it's around the corner, it's on Amboy Road, across the Amboy Road bridge and you got you got dredging so what does that mean that's uh you know just some uh some shovels and front hose uh getting sand from the bottom of the river well it just stirs up a bunch of stuff you remember your grease jar and yeah. shake it up see what happens nothing good so anyway there are troubling things but that's what local ordinances are for that's what uh you know, the the industry has to improve the city. The city, the city, the city uh, encouraged its creation. Yeah, to cover up the uh, center block wall. Yeah. No, you're right. You're right. It's just it, you will you will understand this as you mature through life. So, uh, we don't live on the good ship lollipop. Life is not perfect. Every once in a while, something. Yep. It's not creating it. It's supposed to be. Well, they recycle. I appreciate what they're doing. It's just not very attractive. 
No, 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 I never. Right. I think that would uh, that would not cause a problem. There are other industries that do, but again, uh, there's so many issues out there. They'll be with us forever. Uh, just don't go to sleep. <laughs> don't miss it. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and there are all sorts of ordinances on uh, you know on, on the architecture how you can deal with it. They've got they they've got that covered. I think I think that's that's pretty well uh, that's that's pretty well. Um, I'm not I, I never use the word solved. I just use the word it's it's uh, under control for the for the for the for the short term and possibly even midterm. The idea is that they have instead of trying to. A regulated detail what every building might look like, uh, like little Switzerland or Helen, Georgia. Uh, they say it's like uh, I forget the, the the word for it, but block architecture, uh, where they it's almost like it's almost like they're designing a region with Legos, and and you're saying this is this is what it look like. You know, you just can't have a thirty story thing right here, or you can't you can't have uh, too little development. Here, that was one of Karen Craig Nolan's great arguments for convincing the powers that be to to invest millions to develop the River Arts District. She said, "I mean, when you're when you city councilor, you're always thinking about taxes and balancing the budget." And she says, "Here's the aggregate 